What? Why isn't it counting down? Well, welcome everybody to how to use video to improve your act. This is David Crone. For those of you who don't know me, it is I'mNoDummy.com. You guys can check me out later. But today we're going to stay focused and I'm going to just get this moving right along. What we're going to cover today is why you might want to use video. we got always got to start with why. I'm going to cover some of the how, some basic equipment. I'm going to cover some tips and techniques and give you some bonus, tech ti some bonus tips here. And by the way, uh, that video that you see right there on your screen, that is my DVD that I released in 2009. And I recorded that entirely myself. It's a completely self-produced. And you can do that too if you get there. But that's not actually what we're talking about today. Let's talk about why you need to video record your act. My perspective is that recording your performance is the third best thing you can do to improve your act. That's right, the number three best thing you can do to improve your act. And that's what this is about, is improving your act. Now you may be asking, what's the number one way? Well, the number one way obviously is practice. There is no substitute for practicing. Sorry folks. Practice, practice, practice. When you've done that, practice some more. But we're going to talk about video. So which shows should you record? Every one of them. Don't hold back. Do every one of them. Why? Well, the first of all, you're going to build a library of performances to feed your ego. <laughs> I don't want to understate that. It really is cool, and I'll show you a picture later of some of my library. As you go along in this career, it's really fun to look back and see how many shows you've done. And when you see your library, it's really cool. You're going to provide yourself with a historical record. And you're going to get to track your progress. It is kind of fun to go back and see how bad you were several years ago. You're going to save these videos, and it's really fun to refer back to them if you need to go back to a client. Now, I know some people take extensive notes about what jokes they told, what routines they did. For me, I don't really do that. I would much rather pop a DVD into my computer, scan through it real quickly, and I can see what I did three years ago for the same client. It's pretty cool. You could use these demo clips to, to you could use these to use demo clips. Uh, that's fine. Um, you want to get fancy with that. We're going to talk about that later, but really we're talking about improving it. And you're going to want to capture those great ad libs. Again, for improving your act, there's nothing better than being able to recount what they are. You've been there, right? You've done a joke, and you said, wow, I had a great joke in that. Oh, I know where it was in the routine, but what the heck did I say? If you video record your act, then you're going to be able to go back and recall that joke, and then you can throw it in as a pre-programmed ad lib. But mostly, this is about making your act better. So I mentioned my library. Well, here is my very first library. Those are mostly mini DV tapes. Uh, there's a couple 8mm tapes in there, and there's a couple mini DVDs as well. I had a friend come by and record that. Those are old. Uh, these go back as far as 2006. Um, and then at some point, I got out of the tape business. I'll talk about that later. My current library is all hard disk. Uh, that is a 6 terabyte RAID array in my basement uh, behind concrete walls and glass block. And the uh, unit beside it is a battery backup unit, so it never crashes. Now you might be saying, what do you do with all of that? That's a big archive. Well, you know, when I'm being really good, I will actually burn the raw video from one of my one of my gigs and put it onto a disc and I'll put that in the folder for that client. So when they call me back in a couple of years and we go back to the same client, I pull out that video. It's right there. Yeah, that doesn't really happen very often. Mostly now I've switched to just leaving it all online because I just buy hard disks and they're cheap. If I'm being really good, I'll actually create a playable DVD. The, the first one I was talking about is the raw video. It doesn't play in a DVD player. It's just a data file. The second version is actually burning it to a DVD so I could stick it into a TV and watch it somehow. And if I'm really, really being good with my video, I will actually take clips from shows and share that with my client. And I'm going to talk more about that later, about uh, some of the value of doing these video recordings. So, okay, what kind of camera should we start with? The consumer video cameras today are fantastic. Almost all of them are HD level quality. You definitely want to look for the HD symbol. 
I strongly recommend going straight to memory. It goes straight to memory. Skip tapes. Don't do tapes. Don't do mini DVDs. Those are still available to a large extent, but don't even go there. Go straight to dis uh, straight to memory. I prefer removable. Me <laughs> yeah, that's easy for me to say. Removable media. Uh, SD cards primarily is what my machines use. I know Sony's use memory sticks, but I'm not really a big fan of those. Um, some of them go straight to hard drives, but again, I'd stick with solid state and uh, memory cards if you can. My particular units are Canon Vixia HF series. That's just a name brand. You guys can poke around and find the ones that work for you. Those are, are ones that have worked for me. I really recommend, though, looking for a unit that has an external microphone input. Now, you might never actually use that. In fact, I rarely use the microphone input on my cameras. It's nice to have, but the point is that when you find a camera that has the external microphone input, that's going to put you into a certain price point of a camera that gets you the level of quality that you're really going to want to have down the road. And expect to pay around four to $500. They keep getting cheaper. You can buy last year's model often for $300, sometimes $250, so look for the bargains. Here's a picture of my older model. That's my first HD camera that I had uh, right after I moved off of the mini, H, uh, mini DV tapes. Uh, again, that's just a model. You won't be able to find that particular model anymore, but if you want to go out and find the specs for it, that'll tell you everything it does. It's a very nice, very easy to use, very small and lightweight. It takes great pictures. So where do you put your camera? I always put mine right in the back of the room. I just set it up on a tripod. I just turn it on and I let it go. You can see the picture here, really fancy graphics here. I know we're really getting high class, and sorry, I don't have a way to do laser pointer on this recording, but uh, you get the picture. The camera's just set up in the back somewhere, and that's the way it goes. Why in the back? Well, the first thing is that I want my camera to be unobtrusive. I just don't want it to be a factor in anybody's enjoyment of the show. I just don't want even people to, to even know that it's there for the most part, just so that they won't think about it. I don't care if they notice it. Um, and again, I'll, I'll mention a few things about that later, but the other thing is that it really captures what's going on in the room. It's been really educational to me to see what the audience perspective is after the show. Your camera set up in the back with just the using the camera microphone itself, you're going to pick up any noises that are in the room. And that's a good thing as you're learning because you want to understand what is distracting your audience. What are they hearing in your show? So noises from the kitchen or the hallway, uh, the air conditioner that kicked on, and now there's this big hum in the room that you can't overcome. You're going to hear that on a video camera that's just set up in the back of the room. You're also going to see people that are standing up to leave. Uh, that's very educational. Okay, what joke did I say? Mm, are they going out with a smile on their face? Are they frowning? Are they going out with a phone because they got interrupted, or are they simply had enough? Uh, or they're just going out to use the restroom. You might see some of that too. The other thing you'll notice is people talking. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more later what to do when you watch the tape, but people talking on the tape is very educational. You don't always notice that when you're on the stage. Uh, you sort of might hear a little buzz going on, but it's difficult to see the pockets. You can watch later. You can see what, um, what groups of people are talking amongst themselves and when are they doing that during the show. It's very educational. And the main thing, though, for the back of the room with just using the camera is what does it really sound like to the audience? I've had a lot of people say, oh, it's just you're going to get the speakers. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I want because I want to know what it sounds like if I were actually in the room. And that's what you're going to get by doing this technique. Let's go over a few random tips here. Uh, you're going to want to get a really tall tripod. Uh, I actually don't use a tripod. It has three legs on it, but it's not officially a camera tripod. It's actually a lighting stand. I'll show a picture of that in the next slide here. But I put a tripod head on it that mounts that the camera mounts to. My goal really was to get the camera up higher than the heads of people that are standing up. Um, if you have the camera on a normal tripod, invariably you will have people noticing the camera and then ducking down as they walk past it. And I just think that's really annoying. It's not very pleasant to the, uh, to the attendees, and it's just, it draws too much attention to the camera. I like to set it and forget it. So get a really big memory card for your camera, or buy one with a lot of internal storage, uh, either way. My camera in full SD mode, uh, full HD uh, on an SD card, sorry, will run nine hours of full HD video. So I just turn the sucker on. Uh, long before the show starts, I trim out the fat later on. 
I just turn it on and let it go. And that way I don't have to worry about it later. It's going and I get to walk on and then focus on the act. All right, here's a couple pictures. Uh, I hope these come through. The picture on the left is my lighting stand in its fully compact mode. Now that all together is about 28 inches long and it's really light as well. That is the stand that's there on the right hand side, fully extended, that's in my office. And that, at the very top there is about seven and a half feet up in the air. So as you can see, that's pretty darn tall. And I wanted to give you a perspective on how I made that work. So a lighting stand doesn't really have any kind of um, attachment at the top. But I found these gizmos at the camera shop. Uh, you can find them on B&H Photo or you could go to Amazon. Or if you happen to have a camera store in your town or a big city, it's really helpful. Just go around and poke through the junk bins. That's where I found these things. Uh, I found a ball head, uh, which means it just has one attachment to it. Go to a camera store and ask questions. You'll find it. You can probably even find some of these things at Target. Um, you can find things that mount onto anything, basically, and that you can mount your camera on on top. So the, really the key here is the ball head. That other gizmo that the ball head attaches to is just the way that I found to make it work. Now, you, you might be saying, okay, well, that's not a very stable tripod. Well, it's not, and I really don't worry about it because the camera actually has a... a an anti-sway uh, compensation built into it, so it, it's not a big deal. Um, and plus, I'm really just recording it for me. Um, I'm not trying to make high-def videos here in this particular scenario. I'm just trying to learn about my act. Now, the next question you might be thinking is, how do I capture good audio? So let's say you really wanted to do a demo video, and you want to step it up a little bit. Your act is getting to that point. You've got the good camera couple different ways. You can buy a wireless microphone system that is specifically designed to attach to a video camera. I actually own one of these. The one that I have happens to be made by Sennheiser. Um, you guys can look that up. It's a GW100, I think. They're not cheap. Uh, mine was about $600. Now, the nice thing, the, the main reason that I got it, it actually doubles as a portable wireless microphone that I get to take with me. I prefer to use a Countryman headset wireless microphone, and not everywhere that I go when I travel by airplane has one. And so this um, this microphone system will connect into a video camera, but it will also connect directly into a regular sound system. So I can take my own wireless system, and I'm good to go if they don't have one there at the venue. You can. Uh, I think the best thing, though, that what I've found to be the most successful is to take an audio recorder. I have a little digital audio recorder. I don't have a picture of it on here. It's an older one. And I just plug it directly into the soundboard. Take the sound feed directly from the soundboard, and you're going to get great audio. And then you can mix that into your video production later. It's a little bit tricky to get it synced up with the video sound, but it, it works. And then you can balance between the two sounds. You know, ultimately, you can also pay someone to do all of this for you. I have one video that I recorded that I paid someone gobs of money to record me because it was in this really cool theater and uh, it cost me way too much money and I would much prefer to just do all this stuff myself now so but the reality is you really only have to capture the audio any better than what's on the camera if you're planning to use it as a demo video or producing something for sale if you're just using it for which is really the purpose of this talk to improve your act, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't buy you anything. You're actually much better off with just having the camera in the back, recording it as the audience hears it. Now, for those of you tech weenies out there, if you really want to get fancy, you can get a second camera. I actually do have two. Uh, I mentioned plural earlier. And you can take the second camera and point it at the audience. This is what I did with mine. This is also really educational to have a video camera pointing at you from the back and then one pointing at you from the front, uh, pointing at the audience from the front. That's really useful for figuring out where the best audience punch is. Where did I lose the audience? Where did they drift off? Or which ones had them really rolling? So that's really cool footage. Uh, so here's your picture, your classy graphic here for you. Um, just put it up by the stage, point it out at the audience, keep it unobtrusive. I like to hide it between behind plants or uh, other kinds of uh, other kinds of things that they have around in the building because I don't want people to feel like they're on camera. I don't want them to have that self-conscious uh, satisfaction thing going on. So I just put it up there in the front. All right, so let's hit a few common questions and concerns. I know I've talked with a lot of people about doing video before, and these are the questions that I hear a lot. And the first one is, do I need permission to video record myself? And the answer is no. 
You really don't. Uh, I'm going to cover a, a few caveats in the next slide, but basically you don't. You just put it up there and you're recording yourself. I actually put it in my contract writer and there is my blurb. It's right there. For those of you who can't see it, it says, David records most performances as part of his commitment to continuous improvement. Casual visual recording by audience members using cell phones and other handheld devices is generally okay. If you wish to formally record the show, please check with David first and be prepared to provide a master copy of the recording. Now that's a really cool thing, by the way. If you walk into a venue and they have a professional videographer there, let them tape it. Seriously, let them record it. Just make sure that you get a copy. There is, oh man, the, the value of a professionally recorded video where they can pan and zoom and really get the essence of the event. It's phenomenal. And the quality that you'll get uh, will just blow you away. Now, <laughs> that, that comes later when your act is ready after you've done much of this and really practiced it. But uh, don't freak out if you see a camera. I, I know some other entertainers, they really just kind of get bent out of out of shape about that and I just don't worry about it. My act is my act and this is it. And uh, you know, if you're going to record it, that's fine. Just don't, you know, blurb it all over the place the whole act if you don't want to, but most people don't. Uh, they're just recording their event. As long as I get a copy, I'm fine. So when do you need permission? This is really I've spoken with several professional photographers, professional videographers, uh, now, I am not an attorney, so if you get sued, tough luck, you're on your own. But the basic gist of this is that if it's a private event, in other words, the audience is there to meet someone else's expectations. So most of my work is corporate. So most of the people that are in the audience are there because their boss expects them to be there. Even if it's a company party, it might be an optional event for them, but there really is an underlying expectation that they're there. If it's a private event, you're going to need their permission. Only though, and, right, it's a private event, and people in the video are clearly identifiable. So if you set your camera up right, and it's really just pointed at the stage, the only people you're going to have to be concerned with getting permission from are the people that you bring up on stage that show on the video. And number three is if you plan to release the video publicly. So if the only purpose of your video is to improve your act yourself, you're the only person that's ever intended to watch this video or maybe somebody else that you're conferring with uh, on your act, if that's the sole purpose, you do not need permission regardless. Now, the nice thing here is that if people paid an admission to come to the event, if this is a public showing of any kind and people choose to be there, they've made that choice, a fair, a festival, uh, a theater show where people have bought tickets, you really don't need their permission. Now, it is a nice courtesy to put a little sign up or some notification on the tickets that says this video, this program will be recorded and uh, just so that people know about it. But, you know, by virtue of buying a ticket, uh, there is uh, some legal aspect of public performance and uh, it's fair game. So I really just wouldn't worry about it. For most of your events, and again, for really working on this just to record your act and to get better, just do it. All right, now I mentioned that recording it is the third most important thing that you can do to improve your act, and that the most important thing you can do to improve your act is to practice. That leaves us with the one in between. So the second most important thing you can do to improve your act, have you guessed it yet? I've already mentioned it. Watch it. <laughs> and I'm not kidding here. You can go to all this hassle and trouble and set up your video and record a fantastic video recording of your program. But if you don't watch it, there's no point. You have to watch it. Now, I know what you're thinking. I've heard it before. I hate to watch myself. Guess what? Too bad. And here's the other side of that. If you can't watch yourself, why would you expect anyone else to watch you? Seriously. If you can't watch it yourself, why would you subject someone else to it? Get over it, learn from it, and by the end, after you've done this for a long time, you'll actually crave it. You will come to expect that video that you can review later, and you will love doing it. Trust me on that one. All right, a few tips on how to actually watch it. Now, what are you going to look for? All right, so watch it by yourself, first of all. Um, you really want to do this as a private thing, especially getting started in this process. 
Now, I know that there's been an audience, but when you watch it on video, it is different. And it will be freaky the first times that you watch this. It'll take a while to get used to this. So watch it by yourself. And you might send it to a friend or a coach, but mostly watch it by yourself and watch for some things. Now, I used I had Sammy King as a coach for a while. Uh, Sammy's fantastic, by the way. If you guys ever have a chance to work with him as a coach, jump at the opportunity. Don't hesitate. And here's a couple of things that he did with me. We worked on a video uh, of my act, and that's how we did the coaching sessions. He, this is what he did. We watched it straight through. We took some notes. We watched it again with the sound turned off. That one had never occurred to me before, before Sammy had mentioned it. It was really revealing. Then run it again with just the sound and take more notes. And then finally watch it one more time with both the sound and the video again. Friends, when you do that, it's amazing what gets revealed to you. I just can't even give you the specific examples. It's just amazing. Some specific things to look for when you're going through here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the things to improve first, but you know, before I even get there, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is to appreciate the laughter. You know, I don't know about you, but every once in a while you have a show and you walk off the stage and you think, well, it was okay. It was okay. It didn't feel that good. And then I'll watch the video later and I'll say, holy crap, that joke really killed, or this one really killed, or wow, they really did have a good time. That, that was okay. And it's a really, it can be a confidence booster. So don't let, don't beat yourself up. Don't just beat yourself up. I'm always looking for things to tweak and improve, but it also is a really good uh, booster of your esteem to give you that feedback yourself. You can drink your own Kool-Aid as the session goes. So let's focus on some of the things to look for yourself. So did you hold their attention? And here's some of the things to look for, right? Audience members coming and going. If people are getting up and moving about and milling about and leaving for drinks on a regular basis, you're probably not holding their attention very well. You really want to have the kind of act that says, oh, I, I don't want to go. I, I can't go to the bath. I have to go, but I, I have to wait because I really don't want to miss anything. That's the kind of act that you really want to have. Look for small groups of people talking among themselves. Now, that's really annoying. When you're on the stage and you can identify the small groups that are talking among themselves, it's annoying. And sometimes, sometimes you can't do anything about it. But typically, it ha you can also draw conclusions. Some groups, there's nothing you can do. They're, just, they're not there for you. They don't really care that you're there. They've got other things that they want to deal with. Uh, and there's nothing you can do. But other times, it is a good indicator that maybe you weren't quite as funny as you thought you were, or maybe there's something that happened that you lost them. What you're really looking for is those small groups that are talking amongst themselves, look for when they stop. What causes them to look up and say, ooh, what was that? That's what you want to catch, and then you want to do more of that. It's really helpful. Listen for the chatter. In other words, how much chatter is in the room? How many people are talking with themselves? Because your video probably won't have everybody in the room. Uh, but listen for it. Also, listen for the silence. As much as you want to listen for the laughter, you also want to listen for the silence when you thought there should have been laughter. It's very educational. Some more things. Do the characters look alive? These are all things that you're hearing all the time at Vent Haven, at the convention, from all the people that are talking about being a good ventriloquist. Uh, but these are really good opportunities to see this in your own act. Do the characters look alive? All the time, right? Not just when they're talking. Where are the characters looking? Using a video camera is phenomenal for this because a lot of us practice in the mirror. I know I do. And I, I love practicing the mirror because there's that immediate feedback. But when you see it on a camera, you can see where the characters are actually looking because sometimes they tend to, it depends on the puppet's eyes, sometimes they have a tendency to look up at the ceiling or down at the floor or off to the right or the left. Uh, really watch for that. Are they looking at the audience or are they, or are they looking around somewhere else? Do the characters' movements make sense? Uh, every movement should have a reason. And, uh, oh man, I wish I could pronounce her name. Uh, Tomoko, I'm not going to be able to pronounce her name. The, her video just came out on Facebook uh, from her performance several years ago at the Vent Haven uh, Convention. And it's with her monkey puppet. And it's phenomenal. Oh, it, the, the manipulation that she has with the puppet. Even watch her without the sound. It's hysterical. Every movement that that puppet makes has a reason. There's no jittering about. Now this... I will share with you, this is one of the things that I struggle with. Um, my old man puppet, Wilmer, uh, put rod arms on him, the Dan Horn style rods on him, uh, a couple of years ago, and I'm still getting into it. And I have a tendency to wave his arms around for no good reason. 
Uh, it's my nervous tendency, and his hands are being my hands waving around in the air. In fact, if you could see me as I'm recording this right now, you would see my hands moving around in the air because I tend to talk with my hands. And what happens is that gets translated to the puppet when I have the rods on the arms. So watch for that. It's given me something there to watch for, and I, and I can see improvement uh, over the last couple of years. It's really painful for me to watch one from two years ago when I first started using the arms. Um, but now, most recently, it's starting to get there. It's just finally starting to click. So watch for those movements. Does it look like you and the character are engaged in a conversation? right? Or do you, each of you say a line and then you go to sleep while the other one says their line? Is it two monologues taking place? And are you also constantly looking back and forth at each other? Do, is there a constant interplay? Or does it look natural? Do you look like two people simply on stage having a conversation with the audience, with each other and with the audience? That's what you're going for. So watch for that. The other thing, and I've coached some other uh, performers on this one, are you treating your character with respect? I've, I, there was one particular uh, ventriloquist, I won't say his name, um, but he hadn't known it. Uh, he had been using this this character for a long time, and it's a classic little boy who's getting in trouble, and the little boy is you know annoying to the ventriloquist, and this ventriloquist continued to hit him. You know, it was the the reach out. It originally had started with just reaching out and touching the arm, just putting a hand on him to catch his attention, like you normally would. But he had evolved to the point where he wasn't conscious of it. He was smacking the dummy, and it was brutal. If you were sitting in the audience, you, you felt bad for the dummy, for the character. So watch yourself on that. Look for it. Look for signs that you're manhandling the puppet, what I call puppet abuse. Uh, and the video will really show that. Watch your lips, <laughs> right? If the character is talking, your lips should not be moving. <laughs> Enough said. Are you engaging the audience? Where are your eyes? Where are you looking? Are you smiling? Do you look happy? Do you look like someone who belongs on stage? Or are you terrified? Do you look present? Are you there? Are you engaged with the audience? And just a few final thoughts for you guys to think about here. I know I've talked about a lot. This could be expensive. It can be a hassle to set up your camera until you really get good at it. Uh, mine literally takes me five minutes to set up my camera, and I'm done. Make the investment. It's worth it. You will learn so much. It's unbelievable what you, what you will be pulled off of your eyes. What, your eyes will be open to some new things, and you, you're just it'll be phenomenal. Don't worry about poor video quality at this point. Just use this as a way to improve your act. Just record it. Don't worry about the sound. You just need the sound to be good enough that you can hear it. And be honest with yourself on both the positive and the negative. Identify where you need to be proved, improved, but be sure that you celebrate the good moments. Celebrate what's working and do more of it. As I hope you guys have fun with this phone, all the ladies and gentlemen out there, the kids, the adults, everybody that's out there hanging out with your puppets. I'm sorry that you can't be in uh, Kentucky with us at the convention, but you're there with, there with you in spirit. I hope this has been useful to you. My name is David Crone. It's imnodummy.com. And for all you vents out there, what is it that Matt Bailey says? Keep talking for two. Thank you.